AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hey guys, welcome to another podcast, Kurt Schilling Podcast to be specific, and it's a wonderful day. I don't know how many of you out there lost, hopefully all of you, caught the uh, the president's uh, announcement of his Supreme Court choice. Justice Brett Kavanaugh was the pick, and I'm going to go right to the sound. What matters is not a judge's political views, but whether they can set aside those views to do what the law and the Constitution require. I am pleased to say that I have found, without doubt, such a person. Tonight, it is my honor and privilege to announce that I will nominate Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. My judicial philosophy is straightforward. A judge must be independent and must interpret the law, not make the law. A judge must interpret statutes as written, and a judge must interpret the Constitution as written, informed by history and tradition and precedent. Tomorrow, I begin meeting with members of the Senate, which plays an essential role in this process. I will tell each senator that I revere the Constitution. I believe that an independent judiciary is the crown jewel of our constitutional republic. If confirmed by the Senate, I will keep an open mind in every case. And I will always strive to preserve the Constitution of the United States and the American rule of law. I mean, this is exactly what we had hoped for. And how do we know it's the right choice? The Even before it was made, you heard the left going nuts. But I want you to listen to Elizabeth Warren, who, again, to me, embodies and epitomizes everything we despise about D.C. Listen to her, her response to, to the Kavanaugh selection on MSNBC last night. I don't know him from personally, from Harvard. What I know him from are his opinions that he's written, and I know him from the fact that he appears on the list that the Federalist Society put together of people who will overturn Roe versus Wade. You know, that's how we know Brett Kavanaugh. That's the principal way. Donald Trump had a list of people that had been pre-screened by the Federalist Society. And so he knew that everyone on that list was committed to overturn Roe versus Wade, because that's the standard they use. He knows that everyone on that list is committed to overturning health care rights for tens of millions of Americans. So the question then becomes, how do you pick under those circumstances? And Donald Trump picks the nominee picks the person who says, you know, it would be a total disaster for the United States of America if it turned out that the president of the United States got indicted. And so he thinks of this, I think, as, wow, we need to make sure that the United States of America stays safe by protecting the president from what? From investigation, from indictment, from prosecution. That's what troubles me about the whole picture here. Donald Trump has got the trifecta. He's got someone who will be committed to overturn Roe versus Wade, someone who will be committed to rolling back health care for millions of Americans, and someone 
who it looks pretty likely will help Donald Trump if he gets into serious criminal trouble. The amount of ignorance in that set of comments is beyond breaking down. This is where I wonder if people, I don't believe we're that stupid. She really honestly believes that we're going to believe her when she says that President Trump nominated a candidate who will specifically and intently roll back health care for tens of millions of people. Rather than recognizing that it was an illegal set of laws to implement to begin with, forcing Americans to buy something that they don't want to buy or didn't have to buy or shouldn't have to buy. It's just the insanity in, in her is, and, and God bless Jeff Deal, because hopefully he gets her out of office this year, even though we, we need her to continue speaking up, because uh, when she does, every day she speaks, a conservative voter is born. And then the male version of Elizabeth Warren in every way possible, Bernie Sanders, uh, listen to him last night on, on Out Amongst the People, talking about the pick. Are you ready for the fight? Are you ready to defend Roe versus Wade? Are you ready to tell the Supreme Court that we think it's absurd that they give constitutional rights to billionaires to buy elections and then tell women they don't have the constitutional right to control their own bodies. Are you ready to tell the Supreme Court that we are not going to eliminate pre-existing condition? I'm an idiot. I don't even know any other way to put it. He's just an idiot. And and the things that come out of his mouth are every bit as insulting and repulsive as, as the things that come out of Elizabeth Warren's mouth. Those people don't represent American values. They don't represent who we are as a nation. Uh, and, and when they open their mouths, they make that obvious. I want you to listen to, real quick, uh, NBC Nightly News as they talked about the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh by President Trump to the Supreme Court. Listen to this. Listen to this. With maximum drama in prime time, President Trump announced the nomination and praised Brett Kavanaugh as a solid conservative. Judge Kavanaugh has impeccable credentials, unsurpassed qualifications, and a proven commitment to equal justice under the law. A judge must be independent and must interpret the law, not make the law. A judge must interpret statutes as written. And a judge must interpret the Constitution as written, informed by history and tradition and precedent. More than any of the others on the president's short list, Brett Kavanaugh knows his way around Washington. He grew up in nearby Maryland, where his mother was a state court judge, graduated from Yale and Yale Law, and was a Supreme Court law clerk for Justice Anthony Kennedy 25 years ago, at the same time as fellow Kennedy clerk Neil Gorsuch who was put on the Supreme Court by President Trump last year. Kavanaugh met Kenneth Starr during a Justice Department fellowship and became a key staff member when Starr was the independent counsel investigating the Whitewater and Monica Lewinsky scandals. He helped write the final report that cited 11 possible grounds for impeaching President Clinton. He became a White House counsel and top aide to George W. Bush and met his wife, Ashley, while working in the White House. They have two daughters. President Bush nominated Kavanaugh to the Federal Appeals Court in Washington, D.C. At his Senate confirmation hearing, Democrats said he was too partisan. You could not think of another nomination, given Mr. Kavanaugh's record, more designed to divide us. After the hearing about that senator, my mom said to me, I think he really respects you, as only a mom can. He was confirmed 57 to 36. He's been a judge for 12 years and says the years with Bush made him a better one. In a 2009 Law Review article, he said that experience convinced him that presidents should not be subjected to lawsuits or criminal investigations while in office, but said Congress should change the law to provide that exemption. Republican leaders in the Senate had told the president that Kavanaugh might be harder to get through confirmation because of his extensive record as a judge in the Bush administration and working for Kenneth Starr. President Trump apparently believes Kavanaugh is worth the trouble. Did you notice the play on words? And and it, it really is an attention to detail sort of a thing. But did you notice at the introduction how the anchor mentioned that President Trump 
said that Judge Kavanaugh was a solid conservative. No, he didn't say that. He said he was a solid justice, a solid pick. But you notice how they try to to place him on the other side of the fence with, oh, he's a solid conservative. Oh, he's a solid American is what he is. And, And we know this was the right pick, and, and we know that, well, uh, Seb Gorka was on Fox News last night, and he pretty much explains how we know this was the right pick. Listen to, to his reaction, reaction to the left's reaction of the nomination. Look, the, the reaction already is all you need to know about Kavanaugh. The fact that the DNC has already stated that this man shouldn't be anywhere close to the Supreme Court. The fact that Chuck Schumer has just announced that he will use every weapon in his arsenal to stop this nomination. He said that last week it before he was nominated, so that's shocker. Right, right. So this tells you that this is the right man for the job, but it tells you that November is going to be very, very tough for the Democrats. I, I just want to make sure the White House is listening. Bill Shine, this is going to be a very important communications message because this is going to be worse than Bork. I give you the prediction now. They will use every dirty trick in the book to block this nomination, but we can't get it through. You heard the two sentences he made in the East Room. He said, uh, we, I do not believe in legislation. I believe that we interpret the law, we don't legislate it, and the Constitution is to be interpreted, not amended. That tells you everything we need to know, but 2018 is even more important than 2016. This is a, a gigantic game of political Marco Polo with the left uh, screaming, Polo, every, every time they scream it, uh, we know we're getting closer and closer to to the, the, the goal, uh, which is, you know, make America great again, in, in so many words. The fact of the matter is, this is a man who has spent his life in service of others. Uh, his credentials are beyond impeccable. And the left would have you believe that this is uh, a nominee picked by the president to cover his own ass uh, from an investigation that has found exactly zero wrongdoing and zero affiliation with any wrongdoing by uh, President Trump since the day it began. I, I don't even know where to go with, with that angle, other than it is the Cory Bookers of the world continue to make... And, and listen to the, the quote. Cory Booker called it, quote-unquote, a constitutional crisis. When I look at it, it's exactly the opposite. It is affirmation that the Constitution is the law of the land and that the people that are deciding whether it is or it is not are going to read it and continue to adhere to what's written instead of making it up as they go, which we know liberals tend to to want and have done in the past. What an amazing night. And I can't wait to see how this plays out because at the end of the day, if you think about it and if, it, if things go the way they should, and they never do, the left can do nothing. It doesn't matter what every dirty trick in the book is. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Uh, We have a majority, and we will not uh, have the vice president's tie-breaking vote because uh, Senator McCain will not be apparently part of the vote um, because he is he is uh, he is sick and 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 apparently getting sicker. So we're going to have fifty to forty-nine. We have fifty to forty-nine right now, as long as nobody flips. Uh, If every Democrat in a red state votes against this nominee, which I assume is going to happen, they're going to cost themselves their seat which is a wonderful thing, but you've also heard uh, conserv- or liberals say that this nomination is far more important than taking back a majority, which they weren't going to do anyway. We're going to take a short break. On the other side, Kurt Smith, the author of 17 different books, including the classic history of baseball broadcasting. Gonna join. We're going to talk about uh, the nomination, and we're also going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which are the voices of the game, and everybody from Harry Carey to... To Harry Callis and everybody in between talking about baseball broadcasting. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Censorship is a key issue here, particularly for people on the right. Do you think it was addressed adequately? Definitely not. It was useful to name check Diamond and Silk. It was useful to check even politicians who had campaign ads that were shut down. But in every case, Zuckerberg was allowed to essentially dismiss the case and move on. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Hey, welcome back, guys. Joining me now is an author uh, who's written 17 books, including the classic history of baseball broadcasting, Voices of the Game. 
Publishers Weekly termed it a monumental piece of work. It was adapted for ESPN TV. He's a senior lecturer uh, of English at the University of Rochester. He's a Gatehouse media columnist, and he's an AP award-winning radio commentator. He is Kurt Smith. Good morning, Kurt. How are you, buddy? Well, just fine, and uh, it's a lifelong a Red Sox fan uh, and uh, someone who thinks uh, philosophically much like you do. It's uh, it's great to be your guest. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you giving me the time. Last night was, well, it was its own little sequence of events, but I'm, I'm wondering what your first impressions last night were of the nomination, number one, of Justice Kavanaugh, but two, the reaction both by, uh, you know, conservatives and, and by uh, by liberals. I wish we could have uh, cloned uh, Neil Gorsuch because he was uh, my idea of uh, of what a Supreme Court nominee should be, and uh, certainly his uh, his record thus far has been exemplary. We uh, conservatives and Republicans are uh, used, sadly, to being uh, to being let down and deceived by uh, Supreme Court nominees uh, who uh, who turn uh, tail and turn out to be something other than what they had uh, promised to be. Uh, as a uh, as a nominee, uh, I'm hoping that uh, that Kavanaugh will be uh, different than that. I'm hoping that he will be what he uh, has promised to be. Uh, I think the president went through uh, uh, in very detailed and careful fashion uh, regarding uh, his uh, his talks with uh, with the uh, uh, potential nominees. He came down in a in a way that I think uh, it gives me some uh, some comfort uh, regarding how the uh, two sides reacted. Uh, exactly as you would expect them to. Uh, right. Conservatives uh, uh, focused upon the record, and liberals focused upon the hysteria. They did what they always do. They uh, uh, engaged in hyperbole, in uh, in uh, distortion, in smear, uh, and in hatred. I mean, this is what they've become. Uh, yeah. They uh, they call themselves the resistance, not not even understanding how they defame the real resistance of uh, of World War II note. And uh, they engage in character assassination. What can you say when they don't even know who they uh, who they are going to uh, be opposing before they say that they're going to oppose them? This is what the Democratic Party, the once proud Democratic Party of JFK and Scoop Jackson and Hubert Humphrey, has devolved into. It is a sad and pathetic and hateful state of affairs. It's becoming almost the litmus test for anything being done in Washington. The, the louder the left screams, the more American, the more conservative the event or the person. I mean, this guy's credentials are off the charts uh, from a conservative perspective, by the way, uh, which is what happens when you ha- when you win an election. The president gets to pick Supreme Court nominees, and we've been blessed by Judge Gorsuch, and we're going to be blessed again because at the end of the day, if you listen to Republicans talking, uh, you know, and the fact that we have the majority, uh, there's nothing the left can do about it if Republicans stay together. That's the question, though: is are they going to stay together? Yeah. But, uh, well, Republicans uh, tend not to stay together, and Democrats yeah. tend to stay together. That's the sad uh, history of the last a quarter yep. century, dating back to Teddy Kennedy's infamous uh, character assassination of uh, Judge Bork in uh, in uh, 1987, which really began this. Uh, uh, this uh, cleavage of red states uh, versus uh, blue states—that's where uh, right. the uh, the genesis began. If you if you look at this uh, sad uh, division of America, I think it comes down to whether the Republican Party, uh, uh, the, uh, the usual suspects, the moderates and liberals, whether they give the uh, the customary uh, uh, leverage and uh, and courtesy to the President of the United States. And if they do, then uh, then uh, Judge Kavanaugh will be confirmed. It's almost uh, embarrassing to listen to the voices of the left, the Schumers, the the Warrens, and the Bernie Sanders of the world talk about a man who is, you know, beyond qualified. And, and the hypocrisy last night, I think it was uh, Cuomo was talking about the fact that President Trump was going to pick a female judge because she was apparently by her looks before the pick was announced. And when Kavanaugh was announced, he railed on President Trump for not picking a woman. The double standard well, is embarrassing. Living in New York and being accustomed to Andrew Cuomo's uh, posturing and his pathetic uh, facsimile of being a, a national leader, this is a man <laughs> who would be president. He can't even be a decent governor of the Empire State. So perhaps he should focus upon that before he begins to, uh, to genuflect and to pretend that he could be actually be president of the United States. Uh, you look at the Democratic Party and 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 you look at the uh, president's the president's uh, rising poll numbers. And you look at the uh, screeching, the hysteria of the Democratic Party, uh, and and uh, 
uh, the the increasing uh, chances that the Republicans will uh, will uh, retain control of both houses of Congress this fall. And you asked, you have to ask yourself, uh, why are the Democrats so bent on on uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory? These are the folks who a couple months ago were talking about a blue wave. You can't even look for a blue ripple at this point because yeah. uh, uh, you know the. Uh, uh, the the economy certainly has been something in the president's corner, but I think that even even above that, the uh, every, every with every, with every public utterance, the Democrats' chances of being taken seriously as an alternative to the president uh, fade even further. Uh, this is not the party of Franklin Roosevelt, nor Harry Truman, or yeah. John F. Kennedy, nor even Lyndon Johnson, let alone any of the other great uh, Democratic leaders of the past. This is a this is a uh, party. Not simply of tax and spend, but this is a party that that almost unbelievably puts the rights of uh, of people who break the law, who come into this country bent on uh, on, uh, on on rape and murder, uh, on uh, on on uh, circumventing the law of the United States above the uh, above the rights of decent law-abiding Americans. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, Americans ever thought that they would live long enough to see one of the two major parties of the United States ever, ever um, be rent uh, so low that, that you would see that, that they would do this. And yet they do yeah. this on a daily basis, particularly in the two largest states in the country, uh, or two of the three largest at least, New York and California. Uh, there are no moderate uh, Democrats left. There are almost no liberal Democrats left. There are extreme radical Democrats left. They are the soul and the voice of their party, and the more they scream, the better for Donald Trump. Thank God for the electoral college. That's all I can say. <laughs> it's it, you know, it, it and it, the the continued uh, distancing of itself from uh, Middle America, not just Middle America, but middle class America, uh, goes on daily. Hey, listen, I want to switch topics. You wrote a book um, called Voices of the Game, and as someone who grew up. Uh, watching and listening to Garziola and Kubek, and uh, yes. who can remember? And, and part of my life involves uh, highlights uh, announced by the the greats like Harry Callis uh, and Vince Scully. Um, I'm I'm wondering. First of all, I think I, I look at sports announcers and I look at baseball broadcasting almost like I look at music. There's a there's a deja vu element to hearing uh, a Vince Scully call that takes me back to times and places that were a lot more enjoyable in my youth. Um, and I'm wondering when, first of all, what, what kind what, what fan are you? What, what, what's your team? Number one. And two, what's that voice for you? What's that voice that you remember growing up that, that, that you'll never forget? Well, as a, uh, as a very young person before I, uh, before I was, uh, converted to the uh, to the truth sort of like Saul on the Damascus Road my my moment of conversion I was actually a fan of the New York Yankees and uh, Mel Allen the great voice of the Yankees uh, who to me uh, was given a voice by God I, I hope that uh, when I go to the hereafter uh, uh, the voice of, uh, of, of God will be as, uh, as great as the voice of Mel Allen's uh, because uh, it was a, a voice siren sweet and uh, and uh, antebellum, and it was a voice that in upstate New York, uh, uh, where I was born and raised, uh, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing that voice. Um, so that was the voice that uh, was the voice of my youth. Um, but he was fired by the Yankees at a relatively uh, young age, at least my young age, at which point I started searching for another team, and that other team became, uh, became the Boston Red Sox. And that's <laughs> been the team that I have uh, rooted for really since I've been about 10 years old. And so, uh, being a Red Sox fan uh, ever since, uh, the uh, the voice of that team became the great Ned Martin, and Ned Martin was a uh, was a uh, uh, a voice of uh, of great uh, erudition and reason and intellect. Uh, he had a wonderful lexicon. He had gone to Duke uh, University, as you know. He had been uh, a Marine actually in World War II, and had been a part as a, a teenager of the invasion of uh, of uh, Iwo Jima. And would never talk about that, but he would talk about Faulkner, and he would talk about Hemingway, and he was an extraordinarily uh, Renaissance man. And uh, he he befit really New England. I mean, he was made for that. 
he should be a member, a member, incidentally, of the uh, of the broadcast wing of the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, every year, the Hall of Fame awards the Ford C. Frick Award for broadcast excellence. I'm privileged to be a voting member of that body, and have tried with uh, with no success in the last several years to get Ned Martin elected to that. He should be a member, and it's a blot on the Hall's uh, record that he's not. Right. Uh, so Ned Martin is uh, is a voice that uh, I identify uh, enormously with the Boston Red Sox. You mentioned Vin Scully. Vin Scully is the uh, the Roy Hobbs of baseball broadcasting, the best there ever was. Um, I'm uh, Kurt. I haven't talked to one, literally one baseball broadcaster, who doesn't say automatically that Vin Scully is the greatest broadcaster uh, who ever lived. Not simply baseball, but uh, all sports. Right. Uh, uh, in, in, in Toto, he gives you every he gives you everything that you ever want in a broadcaster, and uh, there's no doubt that uh, that uh, he broadcasts uh, uh, better, not simply baseball but other sports as well. And so I think that uh, you know when you when you begin talking broadcasting with people, uh, there's really no right answer, no wrong answer. There are some answers that are perhaps more right than others, but it's uh, it's somewhat arbitrary. It's very emotional. Uh, and you try to step back, be as uh, be as passionate uh, uh, as you can, and uh, to try to be as objective as you can. But it is a fascinating uh, profession, and it's much like politics. Uh, everyone has an opinion, and uh, and you sit back and uh, and you uh, debate right and left, and uh, and uh, try not to punch the other guy in the uh, in the jaw. I liken it to music. I think it's very much like music for me. Even the ones I might dislike are still so talented, it's it's incredible. And and I don't know that people understand, first of all, how tough that, that is. It was, and let's use baseball specifically because 162 games a year for the announcer and having to be fresh every night is, is, is an art. It's a gift. And yes. I had the honor and the pleasure of having some of the most memorable moments of my lifetime ensconced in history by Harry Callis. Oh yeah. In addition yep. to being one of the greatest human beings I've ever known, Harry had a way about him. And I would argue, let me just back up. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. I was born and raised a Pittsburgh Pirate fan. So I grew up uh, with the We Are Family 1970s Pirates. But growing up in Arizona, I was uh, I don't know if the word what word to use other than I was held hostage by Harry Carey and the Chicago Cubs and <laughs> WGN uh growing up. I learned at an early age that being a, and I'm using air quotes, being a, a homer was was actually kind of cool if you did it in a way that irritated the opposing fans but didn't turn them off. And, it, you know, Harry Carey's love of the Cubs was second only to Budweiser in his life. And it was funny because in much the same as Yogi Berra, you were waiting for Harry to say another Harry thing and do another, yeah. and, you know, having Steve Stone there. Um, I was wondering... It, it's a name that this generation doesn't really remember or know very well. But in your discussions and in your talks and in the writing of the book, w w was Harry Carey somebody that ha was influential or at least uh, an integral part of some of the greatest uh, uh, commentators ever? Because I, I would imagine he'd have to be kind of on the Mount Rushmore as far as baseball goes. Oh, he absolutely is. In fact, I wrote a, a piece uh, several uh, weeks ago na naming my uh, uh, top five broadcasters of all time. And uh, Scully was number one. Mel Allen was number two. Uh, Ernie Harwell, I think, was number three. Um, and then uh, Harry was number four, and Red Barber was fifth. Harry Carey, there are really two Harrys uh, that uh, that we can speak of. Uh, the uh, the first was the unbelievably talented Harry Carey that broadcast for a quarter century from the mid-1940s uh, through 1969 for KMOX Radio for the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, at a time when uh, when the uh, uh, Cardinals were in many ways Middle America's team, uh, right. and there was not the great expansion that we have today, and there certainly wasn't cable television as we know today. Radio ruled the roost, and Harry Carey was the most influential broadcaster in the country. He truly was, and the Cardinals were America's team. You can forget the Atlanta Braves; it was the Cardinals then and now. And Harry Carey gave you everything that you wanted in a broadcaster, surpassing personality, unbelievable familiarity with baseball, with its poetry and its lineage and its past and its history, uh, and love of the baseball, of, of, of baseball, of the game itself. I, this is difficult to measure, but if you were to ask me, name the broadcaster in all of baseball 
who has most loved the game, I would say Harry Carey. And I think that he instilled this in, broad, in, in his listeners as well, so that he gave you everything that you would ever want uh, in the game. Uh, that, that Harry is only faintly to be uh, confused with the Harry Carey that we heard in his later years on WGN television. He had had several strokes by then. He had been reduced to what I would suggest is perhaps what, 30 to 40 percent of what Harry Carey had been at his peak. Right. And yet, and yet, Kurt, here is the genius of Carey Carey. Carey, at 30 percent of his peak, was more entertaining, was more fun to listen to, gave you more uh, return on your investment of your time than probably 95 percent of broadcasters broadcasting at 100 percent of their peak. That's how wonderful Harry Carey was. And uh, uh, I had a, a series at the Smithsonian Institution in 1993 based upon my book, Voices of the Game. And we honored any a number of, uh, of uh, the great broadcasters in baseball history, uh, 12 of them, I think, in, in nine nights. And Harry came there, and, we, and, and he packed the uh, Smithsonian. We had 1,000 people there. Uh, he had been, shall we say, uh, imbibing all day. <laughs> and uh, there was no, the beauty of Harry in his later years, there was no difference between, as I say, Harry drunk and Harry sober. No, nope, it was Mark. There wasn't. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he absolutely regaled. He enthralled. He had that crowd enamored, fixated by him. His, his personality was magnetic. He was such an evangelist an ambassador for the game of baseball. God bless him. He was wonderful. And so, uh, you know, people that only think of him in his later years that, that say things that are less than flattering uh, about them, how dare they? He did more things for baseball than, than perhaps any broadcaster that I can think of. Uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was sublime. Well, you mentioned something, and, and I'm, I'm going to close it out here, and I, I, it's way too short, and I'm, I'm definitely going to, offer or ask to have you back because I would love to have a, l a lengthier conversation both political and athletics and sports but the one thing that that I've gotten and I I've since become an enormous fan uh, of hockey since I retired uh, and the, the only hockey announcer that I've heard that I would uh, even even contemplate talking in the sense of uh, of a of a baseball legend like a Harry Carey and a Harry Callis is Jack Edwards and his love of the game his love of the Bruins Baseball yes. announcers, far and wide, and, and, and just by association to a sport that is played every day of the year, they love the game. And you can feel yeah. it and hear it in everything that they do. Uh, listen, Kurt, hey, the book's called Voices of the Game. Uh, you can buy it anywhere great books are sold. I highly recommend, especially for you younger fans of, the, of, of today and the Internet, you, you missed out on a generation of amazing people with the radio. And I would argue that it, in some places it's still the best way to, to catch your favorite sports team and listen to them. Kurt Smith, thank you, buddy. You take care of yourself. You bet, Kurt. Thank you much. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. I think that it's the epitome of hypocrisy. Unless you fall in line with their liberal agenda, this uniparty globalist liberal agenda, they will never support you. They, they, they use the whole gender issue, of course, as some kind of tool to prop up their, their messaging, but... It's the phoniest thing. Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Welcome back. Joining me now as they do each Tuesday, Second Amendment Tuesday, is Armed American Radio's Mark Walters and the author of Podcast Bullets, which is out on Breitbart uh, News Today, Dr. A.W.R. Hawkins. Last night was an amazing night, and it was everything you had hoped it would be in a bag of peanuts. Judge Kavanaugh is now nominated, and the first thing I could think of, uh, and I'm going to direct this to you, A.W. first, we've talked about this, the Heller versus Columbia ruling in which Judge Kavanaugh wrote a dissenting opinion. And I was wondering, A.W., first of all, your initial thoughts on the, on the nomination. But secondly, what does the, can you tell people what this might mean for us as Americans, constitutional Americans, and Second Amendment loving Americans? My thought on the pick was Trump did exactly what he said he was going to do on October 9th, 2016. 
I'm paraphrasing him, but he basically said he was going to use the Supreme Court to save the Second Amendment. And that's exactly what I thought of when uh, when he nominated Kavanaugh. Now, to your second question, what Kavanaugh's position means, uh, we had uh, District of Columbia v. Heller in 2008, and the District of Columbia responded to that by passing every regulation they could get away with to try to keep gun control in place. That led to... Heller versus District of Columbia, which was the 2011 decision. And in that decision, Kavanaugh wrote that semi-automatic rifles are constitutionally protected. What does this mean for us? What it means for us, and the Democrats know it, assault weapons bans will go the way of the dinosaur if we can get Kavanaugh in because Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, has already made clear that he believes AR-15s are constantly protected. That was the position of Scalia. And uh, and so I would guess that that's also the position of some of the others uh, on the pro-gun side of the court. So if we can get Kavanaugh in there, it won't be long until the Democrats can scream and cry and take new kinds of medication, but they won't be able to pass gun control. Mark, one of the things that, that I think the conversation becomes is realistic again in the sense that uh, assault weapons and semi-automatic rifles are not the same thing, and it's not a small distinction. But when he says in the ruling, uh, in his opinion, semi-automatic rifles like semi-automatic handguns have not traditionally been banned and are in common use by law-abiding citizens. The fact of the matter is that's an injection of real-world truth that the left has been able to to hide behind for, for far too long. And we've seen laws in the last 12 months creep up that had he not been appointed, I think we would be dealing with. But your thoughts on, on the on the nomination, number one, and two, what it means for you and I as law-abiding citizens. Donald Trump is fulfilling his campaign promises to the American public, and he is fulfilling campaign promises to gun owners that he would protect the Second Amendment. And that's exactly what that nomination last night did, number one. What does it mean for us going forward? I think it means, as AWR said, that we're going to start seeing protections that we should in rulings that we should have seen years ago, but we haven't. The court has yet to take up a case since Heller. And, and we look, the Peruta case should have been heard. I keep going back, Kurt, and I think I've talked about it with you. I know I've talked about it with AWR Hawkins, and that is the Wren EDC case. Now, we didn't have to seek cert at the Supreme Court for the Wren versus DC case because we won the Wren versus DC case. And that's what I'm trying to get across, across the listeners right now. The fact that we won that case meant that the city of Washington, D.C. could have sought cert at the Supreme Court to take it to the next level, but they didn't. And the reason they didn't do it was because attorneys general and governors in New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, California, begged them not to because they knew the Supreme Court might take that case. And they knew that if the Supreme Court took the case, they would probably win, or that, that D.C. would probably lose and that, the, and that we would have won that case. What that tells me is, and this is what we know going forward, is that their gun, they know that their gun control laws are built on a house of cards. They understand that. That's why they didn't want that, that Ren v. D.C. case going to, uh, to the Supreme Court. That's what it means going forward. That's why they're petrified. They know they're going to lose. They know we're winning. And all you're going to have to do is watch their reaction. Hell, you're seeing it now, but wait, wait over the course of the next month. It's going to be what the Democrats are going to do is going to be horrible, and it's going to cost them in the November midterms because Americans are going to watch these dirty, lying hypocrites, and they're going to turn their backs on them. I want to paint a real-world picture behind this conversation. A.W., as you remark on a daily basis, uh, violence in America, violence in Chicago. There were 30 shootings this, this past weekend in Chicago, a state where gun restrictions are incredibly tight and pr- incredibly strict. We watched the last mass shooting happen uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, where – all kinds of laws have to be broken for someone to even get a, a weapon. But part of the discussion right now is around Russia East, which I call California now. And the fact that, that AW, there are incidences where military members, people that serve in the armed forces, could be guilty of felonies for not doing anything different on Sunday that they did on Saturday. And I was wondering if you could kind of put that into perspective, because that is absolutely a potential and a possibility. And I could see California being the first to do this and be proud of it and, and, and lead, lead the way, so to speak. In California, you know, their deadline for registering what they call assault weapons was uh, 11.59 p.m. on June 30th. And if you didn't submit photos in a certain way, 
register the gun online, all these things you have to do. Well, then you face you can face criminal charges now, including felonies. Well, if you're a military person, uh, if you're a soldier deployed right now, you couldn't do all that. And so there there's literally a good chance that soldiers will come back from deployment to find either a they will face charges or b they've already been charged or that they might be driving in their car to a range, get pulled over for a speeding ticket. They find out they have a gun that wasn't registered. <laughs> Because they were deployed, and uh, they they'll face confiscation of that weapon, and perhaps even jail time. I mean, all everything I've said; those are all different scenarios, but they're all in play now because of these Looney Tune Democrats in California. The thing that's disturbing me, Mark, is, is that this registration that that AW is talking about from a California perspective, we come to find out through the NRA, uh, as we are often want to do when the NRA gets involved. This personal information is being accessed and shared with other people without the written consent of the of, of American citizens, violating all sorts of Fourth Amendment rights. But once again, the government is proving itself to be what we know it to be, which is completely incompetent beyond doing a couple generic basic things. And watching California kind of, quote unquote, lead the way left, farther left. And, and, and when you look at and I, I, I think it's relevant for this reason, Mark. When you look at the Ocasio nomination in New York and you realize that true socialists are being elected and appointed and you look at California who had an illegal immigrant appointed to a political position. And I've said this to you guys both. If you put legislation in front of Democrats today that eliminated the Second Amendment, they would all sign it. They do want to get rid of the guns and they do want to take our guns. And the fact of the matter is the NRA is is really one of the few now now we have the supreme court but the nra was that buffer for us that to me got bolstered last night by the appointment of, of judge kavanaugh mark where do where do we see reciprocity now that we've been waiting for two years where do we see that or do we see that as a potential coming going forward first off with california real quick i don't know what the numbers look like if awr ha- has any numbers i'd love to hear them i haven't seen them yet but, and i don't know that we will california will protect them but i don't know how many people are actually quote unquote, complying with that law. At some point in time, people have to say, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I didn't see any numbers, but I, I have covered uh, gun store owners who said that, that their customers have told them they're not going to comply. So yeah, I, I would expect surprising. a high degree of noncompliance. And a high degree of noncompliance, if what we saw in Connecticut is indication, that that could be as high as 90%. A lot of it not due in part because people willfully want to violate the law, People have had enough, number one. People don't know what to do, number two. And people, then you've got that handful of people that are just – it's a flat-out civil disobedience. I, they they can, No, I'm not going to do this. So, yeah, the numbers are high. Well, I don't know that we'll ever know what the exact figure is. And as far as the second half of the question, talking about reciprocity, I was assured by a couple different people that we would have seen some or we would hope to have seen some movement on national reciprocity by June. I think this kind of changes the game a little bit with Kavanaugh. I really do. I don't know. You know, obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with national reciprocity, but it's going to tie the Senate up for the next month and a half or two months as we go into the fall out of summer. Let me ask you specifically, you know, l- let's be clear about a couple things. First off, the only thing about this nomination that bothers liberals is abortion. This whole appointment has been about and around a woman's right to get uh, abortions on demand where, when, and how she wants. It has nothing to do with anything else, even though Elizabeth Warren is out there screaming about the fact that Justice Kavanaugh wants to get rid of 10 million Americans' health care, I mean, which, which is just another tangent they go off on. But the fact of the is, and I'll ask you first, Mark, and I would love to hear your backup on this, A.W., how does reciprocity get in front of the Supreme Court or get into legislation in a way that would move it forward? And I think where it is right now, it needs to move as a standalone. And Mitch, simply put, McConnell just simply has to move the bill. AWR, he'll remind us on how long it's been, but it's been over a year since this bill has been received in the Senate and has not yet moved. And I lay that at the foot of Mitch McConnell because he could move this bill at any time. I created the slogan on air, move the damn bill. And he hasn't done it yet. We have to get with Mitch McConnell to do that. I'm, I'm still hopeful. I, I truly am. I'm hopeful that recipro- national reciprocity is going to move. I'm hopeful that it will move this year. I was hopeful it would move by the end of summer. We're not at the end of summer yet. So I'll leave it at that. A gentleman, always a pleasure. Thank you guys for joining me. That's Mark Walters from Armed American Radio, uh, Monday to Friday and Sunday. You can hear him on armedamericanradio.org. And A.W. Hawkins' new podcast, Bullets, is out on Breitbart today. 
another awesome show today. Thanks again to Kurt Smith and to our AW and uh, Mark Walters for the, the conversation. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Winners and losers today. This is kind of a no-brainer. Winner is uh, the Trump administration slash Brett Kavanaugh, uh, the guy we were we were hoping for. I was I was actually hoping for Amy Barrett, but uh, I think we we will get a chance to see and hear her when the uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg seat opens up at some point in the near future. But this was a, a win in every possible way. This gentleman is so far beyond qualified. Uh, the left is going to make themselves look like idiots protesting and and fighting this guy's nomination number one and number two he was everything i hope he would be his, his opening speech last night was was powerful uh it was clear this is an american husband man that uh that loves his country if you get a chance go check out cuomo on cnn talking about the, the fact that he said a couple days earlier that he would uh nominate judge amy coney barrett simply because uh, of her looks and family life more than her legal career, and then lambasted him for not picking her last night. It's just the hypocrisy is amazing. And the losers are, yes, the liberal media, the fake news media, who were backing and forcing and inciting protest before the pick had been made. Let's not fool ourselves, guys. This is about one thing and one thing only. This is about on-demand abortion. There is nothing else the left cares about with this nomination other than their ability to get an abortion when, where, and how they choose. And if you know, if I'm predicting today, I would tell you that in, in our lifetime, sometime the Roe v. Wade will be overturned, and the states will then again regain the right to uh, elect for themselves whether abortion is, is uh, legal or not, uh, which is, you know, I think it should be illegal. But the fact of the matter is, I think you're going to have a lot of liberals packed into a very small space in California and New York and, and, and maybe Massachusetts because those will probably be three of the very few states that will uh, that will pass abortion laws that will be as carefree as, as the left would have them be. So anyway, uh, listen, tomorrow, Sonny Johnson, and I've got sound tomorrow that's going to make your skin crawl uh, from this woman who I, I just can't come up with any other term other than repulsive. Michelle Wolf, but uh, you guys have a wonderful day. God bless. Catch up with you guys tomorrow. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with AWR Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or a firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday, comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash AWR.